Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, and a very special welcome to the students from North Cambridge Academy who are with us this evening. Uh, we look to you to show us how to debate. Um, the students came slightly earlier. They've had a workshop with our competitive debating um, uh, officers. They've had a look around the building, uh, and you are very welcome here this evening. The motion before the House tonight is, this House regrets the fall of the British Empire. This is the week seven debate. Uh, and looking around, I see lots of you who have come to many debates this term. Uh, and will know how these things work, how to intervene, uh, etc. But I do see a few fresh faces, so I thought I'd go through some of the ground rules just as a start. Um, if you look on the back of your order paper, which is on the seats or you've collected, there's sort of information about how to get involved. I won't go through it exhaustively, but the key is that as members, it is your right to participate in this debate. You can stand up during any of the speeches that you hear tonight, and you can say on that point, or will you give way, or point of information. And it's up to the paper speakers whether they let you make your point, but I've asked them all to be generous with their time and to take as many as possible. Feel comfortable standing up and intervening. This is a place of polite disagreement, and we expect you to intervene. I'll make one final point just because of the nature of the subject matter. My job is to facilitate your right to intervene. It is not my job or my right to intervene as the chair. I will do so if the conventions or the rules of the society are broken, and I will do so if the language is not in keeping with the good spirit of this society. But up to that, my job is not to participate in it, it's to facilitate you guys participating. I won't say any more. I'm very much looking forward to this debate, and I'm looking forward to what not only our guests have to say, but what you guys have to say too. Our first speaker this evening is Dr. Zaria Masani. Dr. Masani is the author of Macaulay, Britain's Liberal Imperialist. He spent two decades as a current affairs producer for the BBC and is now a freelance historian, journalist and broadcaster. Dr. Zaria, the floor is yours. Um, friends, ladies, gentlemen, I'm not here to uh, propose the return of the British Empire, uh, but I am here to celebrate some of the le very positive legacies of the empire and to mourn the passing of some of those legacies in some of the uh, nation states that have re replaced the empire. Um, I think uh, looking back over the last several millennia, empire has been the default mode of governance for all aspiring peoples, tribes, nations. And some empires have been more benevolent, more inclusive than others. I would argue the British Empire has been probably the most benign and most inclusive. And I will say why. I would also argue that much of British multiculturalism today is derived from our experience of empire, which was a very multicultural, multi-ethnic affair. Now, what was special about the legacies of the British Empire, and is the world really better off without it? I would say that what the British Empire gave to almost all of the Asian and African countries it ruled was a sense, some of the foundations of modern nationhood and the aspiration towards eventual equal partnership within the empire. And this was not only true of the white dominions. So starting with that, I think if you look around the Commonwealth today, it is not coincidental that almost all Commonwealth countries have some form of democracy, perfect or otherwise. That's not true of the nations that have come out of the French, Spanish, uh, Portuguese empires. Um, in India, where I come from, the British introduced for the first time the rule of law. Now, the worthy baroness opposite is uh, very much a product of that very honorable school of law of defending li liberties, human rights, standing up for equality, for gender, and in her time as liberty is encapsulated those rights. And I think they were planted in India very much by the British Empire. If you look at the kind of regional warlords we had, 
the kind of brutalities that were inflicted by people like Tipu Sultan, impaling people as a form of punishment, tying them to the feet of elephants, um, also looking at caste oppression. Because, uh, you know, one of the things that the British introduced was equality before the law. And, uh, you know, just giving you a couple of examples, in pre-colonial India, a Dalit or untouchable got the death penalty for, co for cohabiting with an upper caste woman. But a Brahmin who murdered a Dalit faced no death penalty. So there was this complete sort of inequality in the way that the law was applied. Um, this changed very much under the British Empire. Uh, the rule of law in India certainly meant that there were, the courts did not distinguish between different caste groups. Uh, people were equal before the law, provided they, of course they could afford to pay for it. The British Empire also abolished slavery across the empire by the 1830s, and that was not um, something that happened in the rest of the world for much later, and in fact, you can argue that modern slavery continues today, in mainly in areas like China and Africa, which uh, the British were not able to emancipate. So the emancipation of slavery also went hand in hand with the emancipation of women. Now, in India, uh, the British uh, abolished something called sati, which was the immolation of Hindu widows. They abolished female infanticide. They uh, allowed the remarriage of Hindu widows, which had been pro prohibited. So there were many steps, including contraception, um, simple obstetric and contraceptive ad advice, which stopped women becoming mere breeding machines. So the idea that women had rights came very much from the British rule of law. Now, you think, of course, the British rulers made these laws in their own interests. You these laws, these laws, sorry, I need, want to complete this point. These laws were made very much by, in partnership with Indians. Uh, as part of a kind of indirect rule, which the British specialized in, we're in partnership with local elites. So you had, for instance, a great Hindu social reformer like Raja Ram Mohan Roy acting in concert with his friend and ally, the Governor General George Bentinck. So there was a very close alliance between them to abolish sati and other anti-feminist uh, ideas. So if you consider the fact that about 100,000 Brits ruled about 300,000 Indians for almost 200 years and did it with the exception of 1857, which most of India supported the British in suppressing, uh, they had to do it in partnership. So one of the ways this was done was through representative bodies. Now, people don't realize that representative bodies in India didn't happen in 1947 with independence and become the world's largest democracy. It started in the 1860s with municipal self-government, admittedly on a restricted franchise as it was in Britain, but from municipal self-government in cities like Bombay, which I come from, the city fathers of those cities then graduated to provincial elected assemblies and eventually, in 1935, the Government of India Act, which was the basis of the 1947 Independence Act, gave the franchise to 30 million men and women, and women were always included in um, British franchise in India, uh, even before they were in Britain. So 30 million, one-sixth of the Indian adult population got the vote, used it to elect completely responsible government in the provinces. Seven Congress ministries took office. So this was 1935. It was the basis of our independent uh, constitution. I also want to come on to another pillar of modern nationhood, which was economic integration. The British Empire is often accused of looting and plundering. What they actually did, if you look at the figures, and I want to give you a few figures, 
they took about 5% of national income. That was about a third of what the Mughal pre-colonial state used to take. And this is according to, uh, British, to Indian economic historians like Tirthankar Roy at the London School of Economics. I strongly recommend his Economic History of India, which explodes the idea of this drain theory that the British somehow, it was a zero-sum game. The British took from India and they didn't give. The inward investment, and again, I'll give you a figure uh, here, which is that the inward investment of capital, which was very scarce in India, was the equivalent of 23 billion pounds between 1860 and 1913. Yes, on that point. Um, if British investment and if the British economic project in India was so successful, then how come in relative terms, when Britain arrived on India, it held 30% of the world economy, roughly? When it left, it held less than two? Can I answer that? Yes, India had 25% of world GDP in 1700 because it had 25% of the world's population. So if you understand economic history and agrarian economics in agrarian countries with very low productivity, it means nothing. The GDP in India was one third of what it was in Britain. Check that. Now, moving on. <laughs> Moving on to my point about inward investment. No, I want to complete this point. Not now. Um, you've had your turn. You've had your turn. Uh, the average annual return on British investments in India was an average of 3.4%, which was considerably less than British capital could earn on Indian money on global money markets. So India was getting a pretty good deal. It was also getting enormous improvements in trade guaranteed by British naval power for which India was not paying. So there were several advantages from the economic integration. Read Tirthankar Roy, don't believe me, read, he's our foremost economic historian at the LSE, read his economic history of India. Finally, I would like to just come on to one brief point about culture and languages, which the British are accused of somehow, uh, you know, kind of, again, uh, destroying. I can only give you the Indian example, which I know well, which is that the British rediscovered the Mauryan heritage of India and gave us back our classical heritage, which had been forgotten for a millennium. This was by British Orientalists, civil servants researching, digging, archaeological excavations, conservation. In India, we didn't conserve. We threw things away if they were old or broken. This was true all over the British Empire. Uh, um, sorry, I, I might, I'm running out of time, so I'm not taking any more interventions. So I think that the, what uh, in India, certainly, and also if you look at this, controversy about the Benin bronzes. The Benin bronzes that are housed in Nigeria, and most of them are, are housed in museums which were set up by the British. There was no tradition in Asia or Africa of having museums. They didn't exist, uh, so we threw things away. Finally, and I will just take one more minute, um, is the grace with which the British exited. Uh, sorry, no, I do have an important point to make. The key, the key to the peaceful exit, I haven't spoken for 10 minutes. The key to the... Uh, key, okay, well, give me 12. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the key to the peaceful exit was creating a class of people whom the nationalists called Macaulay children, I'm proud to be one. So was Gandhi, so was Nehru, so was my father, who went to prison several times as a nationalist, uh, nevertheless came out full of admiration for his British jailers and for the civility which we, with which political prisoners had been treated. And my father always maintained that you could not have had a nonviolent transition in any empire other than the British, because the British, as he said, played, played cricket. Uh, other empires didn't. The British treated us like officers and gentlemen. And although he was in every Indian parliament till, independ until much after independence in 1970, 
He said the imperial legislature in which he served in the 1940s was the most democratic ever. I think that's a strong personal testimony on which I will sit down. Thank you, Doctor, for those extended remarks. <laughs> I will offer the same courtesy to the opposition this evening. Well, I'll do this with a light touch. I don't want to cut people off. Can I just say that I commend how wise the Doctor was in not taking the intervention from the school children. Uh, it would have been withering. Um, we move to the first speaker on the opposition side, Professor Edith Hall. Can we quiet down, please? I will introduce you, Edith. Pre Professor Hall is a classicist and academic at the University of Durham. She's published more than 30 books on ancient Rome and Greece and their continuing influence in the modern world. Professor Hall, you have the ears of the house. First, I'd like to say that in the uh, Ancient Athenian Assembly, you never applauded till a speaker had actually spoken. It's up to me to impress you, not the other way around. I just want to continue this farther off, all right? I'm going to start with the farther off. If we're going to have powerful personal testimony about our dads, all right? <laughs> I have a photograph. I have a photograph which my working class East End dad, who then rose through the Church of England to great heights in the British establishment, showed me of himself at an Empire Day uh, dinner, lunch, whatever, in the streets of East London in full blackface with a large turban and a diamond jewel at the top of his head. How proud he was that he had been chosen to be the Sultan of Nangaboo in the street in East London on Empire Day as a small child in the 1930s because it is the white man's burden and because it's the white man's burden because they can't rule themselves and we all know they can't that um, he had had to understand at school and through the forms of these kinds of rituals how important it was that we were giving our service to these poor people who were actually eugenically inferior. That is my powerful paternal testimony. And he doesn't talk much differently today at 95. OK, I'm asked to speak against regretting the fall of the British Empire. First thing I'd like to say is that I'm a classicist and a philologist. The word regret is a very interesting one because it uses the re, which is from Latin, um, Latinate roots, and then greet, which anybody here who's Scottish, have a wee greet, knows means to have a little cry. This means to cry again for the fall of the British Empire. Now, I am not going to cry again because Enoch Powell on the night of Indian independence in 1947, apparently wandered all around London crying so hard that various policemen had to offer to take him into custody. I do not feel the need to cry again after Enoch Powell did. Okay. This notion is weirdly worded. I don't know what happens with Cambridge undergraduates these days. I never was at Cambridge. <laughs> Not only was I never at Cambridge, but last year I was told that I, uh, I was interviewed for the Regis Chair of Greek. I was told that I didn't look quite right and uh, that I was, I was told that I was unappointable. <laughs> OK, so that's my knowledge of Cambridge. That's fine. I have a very nice chair at Durham. Now, but the motion is very oddly worded, right? We... Regret, we don't regret, we do, reg we do regret, the House regrets the fall of the British Empire. All right, that means that we actually want to go back if we say that the acme of the British Empire in terms of just sheer scale was between 1907 and 1922. That is normally taken as the years when it owned about a quarter of the world's space and about a quarter of the world's population. So this is a counterfactual exercise we've been set on, which I was always told was a pretty useless form of historiography, but maybe that's what you history undergraduates do at Cambridge, all right? It's counterfactual. <laughs> this makes me think of all those weird movies, which are the premise of which is that the Nazis had won, right? 
So we're in the 1990s, you know, and there are swastikas all over London and the Nazis have won. That's how it feels to me, is that we're going to imagine that we're all here, but the British Empire never fell, OK? So, OK, let's go counterfactual, if that's what we've got to do. So the first thing is we've got to accept that the toxic ideology that 400 years of economic, political, uh, 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 legal, and every other kind of exploitation of a quarter of the planet required um, has not been questioned by MS Césaire or Franz Fanon or any of the other great theorists, that we're still in exactly the same situation as we were in um, 1911 when the great celebration of, of the Indian Empire took place and the entire royal family went off to India. Fine, if you all want to be in the same critical mindset as people in 1911, then by all means vote for the motion. Um, we do not know if the world would have looked like if the sun had indeed never set on the imperium that by World War I had stretched to every corner of the planet. But we do imagine that we're in really unpleasant quarters. Let's do that movie. Having said that, I would have liked to motion just a simple, let's do it, do we regret the British Empire ever happened or not? All right, if we regret whether the British Empire ever happened or not, we can get into these debates about the fact that since about 5000 BC, urbanisation, agrarian farming and various people in Suma building cities uh, for that 5,000 years, so it's now 7,000 years. Actually, it's called the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene has been um, an era of empires. Well, bully for it. The Anthropocene is also the one that has devastated the planet, and the British Empire was particularly good at that. Um, and any, you know, the, the environmental problem that I think would be much more helpful for us to discuss tonight than whether or not we regret the fall of the British Empire environmental problem, the contribution of British tea plantations, rubber plants, sugarcane. Is there a question? Could it be from a woman this time? We've had four men. <laughs> Very sexist. I would just think it would be nice to think that Cambridge University in 2022. Can we, can we not have a minute debate here? <laughs> After four men, a woman would want to be heard. It would be nice to think that. But that's counterfactual. My argument is actually against the previous one, that it's been the default mode of production. The default mode of production needs changing. The default mode of production has wrecked the planet. And the British Empire was particularly good at that, with its particular formulation of enormous sugar, tea, rubber, and other plants, the way that it completely uh, set up the agro-industrial uh, context that we've got. Now, fortunately, the British Empire did go away, which means that we've had a few decades to try to bring something else about. If you vote for this motion, then you're actually voting for um, that, that uh, counterfactual horror, which is a continuing British empire where environmental issues haven't been raised, where post-anti-colonial ideologues has not started to analyse properly how racist ideology works, where we haven't started to question random partition as a general solution to every kind of political, every kind of political problem. Uh, wrecked the planet, 
British Empire was part of the, a great part of that. So both the British Empire and human civilization, because they had the plan, should go away. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get the last bit. Are you making the argument? You said that the British Empire has a very large chunk of uh, liability, let's say, for wrecking the planet and causing environmental disaster. Yeah. In that sense, the whole of pre-1970s economies, all of them, uh, did the same. Yeah. So in a sense, the evolution of human civilization came at an, at an, at an environmental cost. Yeah. So what are you suggesting? Should mm. we be back... Should we go back onto the trees in order not to pollute the environment? Not a bad idea. <laughs> not a bad idea. We need radical, radical rethinking of our entire relationship with nature. This is another issue, and I, I do need to stop in a second. But my final point is simply that all of this stuff, the British Empire was actually completely new in some respects. It was the first empire that instead of just going on to contiguous land masses, which had been the general custom, whether you're in ancient Sumer or in Catherine the Great's Russia, it started uh, cherry-picking all over the globe, leading to the scramble for Africa. It also developed in the 18th century, that's well after Elizabeth I's first sort of colonies went out in the late 16th century, really horrific scientific analysis of phenotypes, which is still absolutely totally fueling the kind of stuff that has led to the tragedies that have in turn led to the backlights matter movement. British Empire was the worst example of bullying, just bullying bigger people, force majeure, going around, pushing around less powerful people in world history. It set an absolutely appalling example, especially to, to Germany, and uh, directly led, I believe, to... Uh, the entire imperial wars of, of the 20th century, it is still always going to be there as a really bad example. That is terrifying. We cannot ever get rid of the example. What I regret is that we didn't boot the British imperialists out 300 years earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, please quiet down. Thank you very much, Edith, for your remarks. I would like to hear from you guys. Um, so, for those who are new, the way this works is I'm going to ask for a floor speech in proposition, opposition, and abstention. Please keep your speeches between two and three minutes, no longer, and please give me your name and college before you speak. Who would like to make a case in proposition this evening? I'm looking around, I'm looking around. I'm going to go there, that hand there, please. Name and college. <clears throat> Kival from Emma. So, so what, sorry, far, what college? What college was that? Emmanuel. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. So far, all the speakers have been talking about the past, but here I'm here to talk about what could have been the future. The British Empire had the opportunity to create the greatest power and become the greatest power the Earth had ever seen, even more so than it already was uh, during its most, you know, height. Britain, as we've stated many times, co covered around 25% of the world's population and land, approximately. And if there had been, you know, civil reform, if the British people from the actual British Isles had recognized that the people in colonies had, you know, the same ability and deserved the same rights as them, then, and granted them equal um, status under the empire, then the opportunity... Um, that the Britain had to become the greatest power on earth was, is unparalleled. It would have been the most diverse project that the earth has ever seen. And the geographic... Go on, mate. Sorry? Of course, yes. But what I'm saying is, if there was enough civil reform... Look, if we've gotten to this stage, right, where we can all agree that racism is bad, then... Okay, well, most of us can agree that racism is bad. <laughs> then, why could we not have not seen that before? And with enough civil reforms, right, you know, such as, for example, in America, during the 60s, obviously, there was the civil rights movement, and that would have been happening across the globe. If that had happened, then imagine what we could have been. Sorry, I, need to, I just have a point. For example... One specific point is, recently in the G20, Biden and both Rishi Sunak announced their desires for global taxation on large multinational corporations. 
okay? Now, I think most people can see the need for this because companies often just, you know, dodge taxes by going to other smaller nations and just, you know, finding loopholes. But with enough control across the whole of the earth, Britain could have basically effectively stopped a lot of this from happening. Even still, right now, Britain uh, allows lots of, there are lots of tax havens under British control. However, with enough political willpower, and in these countries right now where the uh, corporations are going to, you know, with their factories, if Britain had control of them, and there was enough um, willpower to tax these fairly, then we would perhaps be seeing less of a, like, anti-globalist movement right now, and we could have had both the benefits of globalism, as well as um, the benefits of actually reaping on the taxes of these multinational corporations. Yes, I was going to say this. So this requires a lot of reform. <laughs> this requires perhaps federalization, perhaps, you know, yeah? Wait. Or you could just have federalization where everyone recognizes each other as equal, right? And secondly, and lastly, this is my last point, right? Um, when the British Empire left, it left so, there was so much ethnic tension between rival groups. So we saw the outbreak of the Nigerian Civil War, which saw two million people dead in Africa, right? The partition of India, okay? That left so many people dead for utterly no reason, literally traveling from different parts of India to different parts, and they got killed in that somehow. And with this, there, there wouldn't have been that sort of massacre, that chaos that, that came about. Okay, but this question, wait, this, okay, wait. I'm not, I'm no, it's not. You've Let you respond to that, but please, can you wrap up your remarks? Okay, yeah. First of all, it's not, because what I'm saying is that if the British Empire was exploitative, okay, but so was most, the working class of most countries were exploited in any country, like even in Britain, right? That's why we still have so many, um, like so much poverty in the North, for example. Reform is needed. Wrap up, please. Thank you. This was, okay, fine. All right, fine. Okay, I'm not being... Quiet! Please. Wait, wait, can I just clarify? I'm not saying that they're just... I'm saying because of deindustrialization and the, the way that history has played out, that has led to a lot of poverty uh, in the North. And I'm not saying that's their fault or anything like that. Secondly, this was... Thank you very much. I will make one comment. Irrespective of the substance of the speeches, please show the politeness to listen quietly. Ask to intervene, but listen quietly, please. Um, there's loads of hands. I have no idea which one went up first. So, go on then. Just sit there. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay. I'm Bika Hirnandani from Gorton College. Um, since we were sharing stories of our parents and grandparents, um, I think I, I wanted to actually share one. My grandparents lived in Karachi, and uh, we were a Hindu family, and when the partition happened, my grandparents had to leave overnight, and the only thing that my grandmother could take with her was the jewelry that she owned that she hid in my mother's nappies, and that's all that they have from their life in, in Karachi and in Pakistan. So honestly, when it comes to the British Empire, the only thing that I think a lot of Indians feel is that the only thing that we really regret is that it didn't, happen so that, is that it didn't fall soon enough. Um, <laughs> and also, um, I'd also like to talk about the 13th of April, 1919, which was the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, where there were a lot of Indians, and they just went to this place in Amritsar called Jallianwala Bagh, where they were protesting the imprisonment of uh, freedom fighters. There was this British general called General Dyer, who basically surrounded the entire complex and shot at these people for no reason. And when we read Indian history, there are not one, not two, but hundreds of incidences like this. And I think that while there were certain good things that came from the empire, the railways and things like that, I think there were more bad things that came than good. And I think that if we had collaborated meaningfully, there's a lot more that we could have done. So I think that's sort of important for us to... That's probably better lighting. Would anyone like to make a brief case in abstention?
I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. Um, that, just there. I'm looking at you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Olivia. I'm And I just want to make a point in abstention because, yes, we can all pretty much agree that what happened with the empire was pretty bad. However, saying that we regret the fall of the empire assumes that it is well and truly gone. I have to disagree. On a simple level, look at Northern Ireland. It is still considered Northern Ireland because it is British and not Irish. The, the empire has not fallen. Just, it, um, you, yes, you are, absolutely. During the speech, you're allowed to interject, absolutely. So when someone's speaking, you are, uh, any time you can say on that point, it's up to them. Well, you should have done. You really should have done. Um, so, no, 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 I'm afraid not now. Doctor, please sit down. Please sit down. Doctor, please sit down. I'm just going to talk over you. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down, please. Sit down. Sit down, please. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down, please. Thank you. Thank you. This is not fascism. Doctor, with the greatest amount of respect, I gave you more than anyone else to speak this evening. Putin. What a, uh, it, it's a separate debate. We can talk about Putin in the bar. Um, let's move on. Um, I'd like to go to the second speaker in proposition this evening. Of course you are. Of course you are. Right. Um, just... Um, just for everyone's benefit, I will go over the rules again. You are more than welcome to intervene during any speech this evening. You can stand up and say, on that point, point of information, or will you give way? And if the person who's speaking at that time says, I'll allow it, then you can make your point. It needs to be a question rather than the floor speech. But if they don't take it, as you didn't take some speeches from the floor, they're not allowed to carry on with their point. But please feel free to do so at any time, apart from on me, unless you want to make a point of order. I will now move on. Thank you. I'll now move on to the second speaker in proposition, Declan McCarthy. Declan is a third year student reading classics at Queen's College and he won this slot through open audition. Declan, I'm very much looking forward to what you have to say this evening. Regret is, is personal, so I hope my colleagues will forgive me if I admit that I regret the ugly and uh, the whole of the British Empire, perhaps a little more than they do. I, see, I struggle to see past the ugly, perhaps a little more than they do, which is my guilt as a white Brit, I suppose. Um, but it's also a present tense verb. I want to focus on how uh, the, act, the event of the fall of the British Empire affects the lives of people today uh, and how it continues to plague them. I don't wish to compare good and bad. I don't wish to compare bad and bad. I don't wish to I don't think there's any humane measure for doing so. Um, so I just want to comment that I do think the British Empire, over hundreds of years and millions of people uh, all over the world, committed terrible deeds, and uh, I can't forgive them. But it was also founded on high-minded ideals formulated in this country, many of them in this university, and the event of the fall of the British Empire was a time when the, the hypocrisy of many of those high-minded ideals became particularly clear. Fall is not a term I feel we can apply to some earlier occasions of independence. Fall I struggle to apply to the gradual process of democratization in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and other countries. Fall forces me to look at the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, when the British government was forced to accept that uh, the territories it had clinged on to had to be given up when, in effect, the British establishment washed its hands of its crimes in those places where dignity and humanity was most denied and where democracy was not trusted to those that the British government didn't choose to trust. I can't not regret that. I would briefly like to talk about the so-called white dominions. Most of those countries today have their problems. But for the most part, they're secure, they're stable, they're democratic, and they're free. And in those conditions, those countries can reflect on their past. Those countries can ask how they treated the peoples who were there before them, how they treated their Aboriginal populations. Um, and I also want to 
ask about the history of those countries being granted democracy. Because though from the 1860s to 1931, those countries were slowly democratized, before that, the British government's policy was actively opposed to democracy. In Canada, emigration, jobs, and the economy was strictly managed. Yes, of course. Yes, thank, uh, difficult term. Um, I suppose um, they have relatively uh, free presses, uh, freedom uh, of movement and behaviour, and so uh, it's, a, it's a very vague term. Uh, thank you for challenging me for using it. Um, they, are, they at least have freedom of academic discussion, uh, freedom of the press, and so on. Um, for, for a long time, for the 18, for, until the 1860s, particularly after the uh, American uh, War of Independence, those countries would, were suppressed so that democracy would not develop. And yet, as soon as the British government changed its mind, it showed a remarkable capacity to create democracies. And so, those countries' democracies, their stable democracies that exist today, were born. But, as uh, is in the case in Canada, where First Nations were not granted the vote until 1960, or the more obvious and poignant example of South Africa, it is clear to whom they trusted that democracy. So what about everyone else? It took until, the 19, until 1945, when the British government had been basically bankrupt for 25 years, to grant freedom to the other 700 million or so people in the British Empire. This was not the result of high-minded ideals. This was the result of bankruptcy, of violence, of protests, of hunger strikes, of panic in post-war Britain. A, a, a country where, uh, which realised that it could not cling on, panicked in India, gave itself three years to grant India independence, and then brought it back to two. Partition was ugly. 14 and a half million people were displaced. Somewhere between 500,000 and two million were killed. That panic cost people's lives when 25 years earlier, they could have simply uh, uh, put in a plan. The, the example is even more poignant in Palestine, where the British government had no plan. It walked out in 1948 and simply left the UN to fix the problem, the mess we can still see today. And yet, those lofty ideals were still being repeated. In 1960, Harold Macmillan gave a speech in Cape Town declaring that the winds of change were blowing through the continent, that he would grant independence to various colonies in Africa and outside Africa, of course, only after violent revolt and rising in... Uh, in uh, it's escaped me. <laughs> the the, the Mau Mau uprising. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, and yet, those democracies, that many of which exist now, took a long time to be born. In Nigeria, in Ghana, in Uganda, there were military dictatorships. In Zambia, in Iraq, in Yemen, in South Yemen, in Egypt, not technically a colony, but nonetheless dependent, um, there were one-party states. And in Sierra Leone, they still swing between the two. UN peacekeepers are still going into that country to keep peace. Even in one of the relative success stories in Kenya, there was... a. Oh, it's Kenya. Um, in Kenya, those straight lines they drew on the map, they had consequences. Consequences for t ethnic tensions in their politics, particularly for Kenyatta's uh, regime 15 years, but still today in Kenyan politics. A relative success story still marred by the lazy light drawing of lines on the map. The British government drew lines knowing it had to and yet couldn't bother to do it properly. And that has created ongoing problems in those countries. Was bank Britain was bankrupt by 1920. Should have known. And in its failure, the lo its lofty ideals were revealed to, let, to be, perhaps be less so. So, sorry, how much time have I got? Okay, yes. Um, what was going on at home was perhaps no better. There were the same high-minded ideals repeated here. Britain was welcoming. Britain was open. Open arms, open doors. Promises of citizenship made in the 1950s and still denied today the ongoing failure of a panicked, uh, a panicked fall that could have been a, a, a casual and careful dismantlement planned over a lo much longer period of time. The lies and the myths that are still repeated in our, in our discourse today, lies and myths in politician, the mouths of politicians, of popular figures, everyday discourse still repeating those myths born in the mood of panic of the 1950s. There are still great suffering in this country as a result of those myths, and they are still repeated. So why am I standing on this side of the chamber? I hope you probably all asking. Because British Empire did not have to fall, 
The British Empire had shown in Australia and Canada and New Zealand and others a capacity to build states vol voluntarily in a way that no one would ever have described as the fall of an empire. But it was blind, it was arrogant, and many were racist. And so, across most of its empire, it failed. It failed, and the empire fell. And the consequences are still being felt today. How can we not regret that? Well done, Declan. Uh, the second speaker, in, can we quiet down, please? Thank you very much. The second speaker in opposition this evening is Nicholas Davies. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to, in future, what we're going to do is we're going to do the bio and then the round of applause, just so there's not two rounds of applause, although he very much deserves it. Uh, Nick is a first-year student reading HSPS at Homerton College. He won this slot through Open Edition. Nick, the floor is yours. Can everyone hear me with this bloody thing? Oh, okay. Is this okay? Can everyone hear me? Excellent. So, this house regrets the fall of the British Empire. At its heart, the idea that we should regret the fall of the British Empire invites us to glorify what is ugly and forget what should be remembered. Defenders of empire, as we've seen today, typically portray it as an increasingly enlightened despot, which provided instability and modernity the world to the world despite its flaws. They argue that such an empire was not made just acceptable, but redeemable by these qualities. But this narrative, I believe, misses the fundamental point about empire, which is that if you just myopically focus on the cherry-picked moments of enlightened progress, this marks the fundamental, unerring, unchanging truth of empire, that at its heart, it must always be oppressive, Britain did abolish the slave trade in 1807, but this in no way softens the fact that in the 1820s, British settlers committed brutal genocide in Tasmania. When the British settlers came in 1803, they found between 4,000 and 15,000 Tasmanians there. By 1847, do you want to guess how many there were? None. 47. 47 Tasmanians and they imprisoned the remaining 47, and in the next 10 years, there were none. If I may. Yes. Point of order, speaking as an Australian and with someone next to me who has worked in the field as well, we have to be careful numbering the number of Indigenous Tasmanians left. Uh, many um, consider to be members of the Indigenous Tasman uh, Tasmanian community. That's not to say terrible crime was not committed, uh, but we risk robbing those who are still members of that community Within that, I take the point, but I'm speaking within that context and I'm speaking from the cited scholarship of the time, which nonetheless gives a broad outline of the crimes of empire, but I do take the nuance of your point. Moving on. Yes, it is true that the British Empire gave greater self-governance to colonies like Canada in the 1830s, but this in no way absolves the fact that in the 1840s, Britain became the largest drug dealer the world has ever known. <laughs> we were quite literally like a pasty Pablo Escobar with gunboats. <laughs> we addicted 15 million Chinese citizens to what was essentially heroin. And yes, the British Empire did play a fundamental role in defeating the scourge of fascists. Real fascists, I'll have you know, not the ones that you purport to sit here. <laughs> And the British Empire did play a proud role in that. But that doesn't obscure the fact that after World War II, 
They engaged in the suppression of the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya in the most brutal and dehumanising way imaginable. Between 160,000 and 320,000 Kenyans were forced into what were essentially gulags. And tens of thousands of more were forced into villages with indignity, guarded by the, spar the barbed wire and watchtowers that had to guard them. Systemic rape and torture were the tools for maintaining that system. This was not the 1850s. This was not the 1750s. This was the 1950s. This was meant to be empire at its most modern, at its most civilised. No, just a second. But the bitterest of ironies is that even at the era where the empire was at its most, meant to be at its most modern, its most representative of what it would be like if it was resurrected, even at that point, it could not help but act with the most barefaced barbarity. And it's the reason that the British Empire was oppressive, from Roanoke Island to decolonisation of Africa in the 1960s, was because fundamentally it must be oppressive. Empire's oppressive because when you invade and conquer a land, when you exert brute power over your fellow human beings, it requires a system of degradation. It requires a system of brutal violence. And it requires a system where you rob people of every scintilla of dignity that they have. Yes? Point of information. Uh, apologies for calling you fascist. Uh, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't realise that, you know, interjections were limited to when speakers were speaking. But I want to correct you on two or three points. Firstly, first, uh, uh, yes, I'll be, I'll be quick. Uh, firstly, the Chinese were addicted to opium from the 16th century through overland exports and imports, much before the British import trade took advantage of that. So there was a cycle of addiction and uh, demand and supply. Secondly, we've heard about partition in India causing hundreds of thousands of deaths. Partition in India was caused by Indian politicians in defiance of the British Cabinet Mission Plan. Read the Cabinet Mission Plan to retain India as a confederation right up till the last date, and when Nehru and Mountbatten scrapped it. Uh, thirdly, Jallianwala Bagh, the officer concerned was a rogue officer who was cashiered out of the British Army. It was condemned by the House of Commons, led by no other person than Churchill. There was a lot of op opposition to General Dyer. There was some support for him, but it was not an unmitigated uh, massacre, and it was an exception. Thank you. You know that if I was a drug dealer, I'd love to hire you as my lawyer. Because <laughs> you're... Because I can imagine you... Yes, the Baroness is there. Because I can imagine being sat there, and you stand up as my lawyer, and you say to the judge, well, oh, it doesn't matter that he greatly expanded the drugs trade or that he addicted those millions to heroines because they were getting their drugs at a smaller scale from someone else before. Let him free. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll tell you, Doc. Uh, and I'll tell you, Dr. Masani, the reason that this was the case, that, you, that they did do this, is because if a group of people remain too human in the eyes of the conquerors, they cannot be conquered. That is why there's the degradation and racism, because without that, you can't muster the stomach to muster that brute force over people. It's not only, no thank you, it's not only the empire does those things, it must do those things. And for those of you on your side, this is the uncomfortable truth that you have to reckon with. Look at Cyprus a country my grandparents emigrated from. In the struggle against imperial rule, those who were suspected of being part of it were simply detained and tortured. They were given, they, now 50 years from now, a situation has arisen where they've sued the British government successfully for 33 million pounds. That is a testament to the unambiguous nature of the wrongdoing. Yet the fact that they are even in a position now where they were given the opportunity to ask for justice, where they weren't laughed out of court, where people who looked like my grandfather, 
were given that dignity within court would not have been able to occur within the structures of empire. They could only ask for some recourse to justice outside its brutal and oppressive structures. <laughs> we only have... No, no thank you. I need to get through the speech, so I'll only... I won't take them more. We only have to look to the east of Ukraine to see the truth of imperialism written in blood and the broken cities of Kiev, Kiev and Kharkiv. The resurrections of imperial fantasies are not distant figments of the past, but live salient issues. So when you walk through those doors tonight, please bear that in mind. So I want to lay, lay, nail the lie tonight that the empire laid the ground for the liberal values of our nation, embodied in institutions like this university and union. I find it stunning and tragic in equal measure that you can attribute to the empire the fully-fledged establishment of democracy in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, when a concept meant to embody power to the people was only granted after the majority of those original people were murdered, dispossessed and forced off their lands. I find it... I find it stunning and I find it ridiculous that you can call an empire liberal, which so destroyed the liberal values of even the great English Enlightenment thinkers of that time. Read Diderot, who even in the 18th century expressed horror at the imperial brutalization in the Americas. Some of those thinkers in the late 18th century recognized the truth that the people in this chamber must recognise tonight, the horror and the shame of empire. And do you know what the tragedy of it is? The biggest tragedy of it is, is it didn't have to be that way. Those values, Hobbes, Hume, Judeo-Christian morality, all of that could have been exported not at the end of a barrel of a gun, but through free trade and open arms. We chose to do it this way. We chose to do it like that, and that had the consequences that it did. Oppression was intrinsic to the empire. Spreading those values wasn't. And if we did it in a less oppressive way, we'd have gained so much more back. We'd have learnt so much from them. And the world would have been different. It was an active choice. So do not mourn the empire's loss. Grieve the fact it happened. And grieve for the people still suffering because of its legacy today. The racism. The borders carelessly crafted and the neo-colonial mindset of Western leaders, which still pervades. The sun may have set on the formal empire, but the nightmare of this legacy still exists. We cannot undo what has been done, but we do not have to legitimise it in history. I'm a great believer in the liberating power of progress, but if you vote for this motion, what you are saying is that you don't want to escape the past. You want to retreat to it. You want to cloak yourself in the intrinsic oppression of that past, I don't want this chamber to be trapped by that. I want us to look unnerringly at the past with sickening, visceral tragedy, stare at it, uncomfortable as it may be, and then look up when we vote and say, not in our name, not in our name. Thank you. Right down, please. Well done, Nick. I return to the membership. Who would like to make a case in proposition this evening? Um, I'm a bit shocked myself that I'm standing up on this side. That was not what I was expecting. And I really do agree with, you know, some of what Declan said, most of what Nick said. But I've found, essentially, that the, prop the, the opposition, sorry, has sort of failed to address the point that Declan made that... Um, we can regret, as you said actually, when the British Empire fell, and we can regret how the British Empire fell without regretting that the British Empire fell. We're not really debating 
what the, well, some of us are, um, we're not really debating uh, that, whether we regret that the British Empire fell. And I would argue that um, in many ways, the ways, in many ways, uh, Britain leaving nations like Nigeria, for example, relatively rudderless, um, without you know, the resources or uh, the capabilities for leadership that might bring them uh, into a democratic government, meant that uh, the switch between you know, military and civilian rule just left a power vacuum and, and a cycle of, of undemocratic and uh, inhumane government over the people. And I wonder if uh, the opposition may respond to the idea that uh, we can regret how the empire felt without regretting that it felt. Would anyone like, finally, to make a case in abstention? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Honourable Chair. I'm Caleb and I'm from Clare Hall. So, yes, I am actually a little bit undecided, you know, about this motion today and hence I thought, you know, I'll make, you know, I'll stand in this corner of uh, abstaining. So, let's start with some um, silver linings. How about that? Silver linings from the empire. The fact that I can have chicken vindaloo, okay, in London, and in the same day have um, Chinese cuisine in London, Chinatown. I think that's not too bad, actually. There are not many places in the world where actually you could get so many different cultures and cuisines all in one place. That's one. One silver lining. Second silver lining. Going to the British Museum, there are not many other places in the world where you can see, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, Babylon. One moment, one moment. One moment, one moment. Which was going to my point when I was in, you know, the uh, China section and I was looking at some Ming vases and I was like, that looks familiar, isn't it? And, <laughs> and perhaps the biggest silver lining of all is that I can actually communicate and be understood today with, you know, such a large and diverse audience. I think that perhaps is perhaps the biggest silver lining from the British Empire. And if I was speaking in Mandarin, I think that would be much more difficult. Yeah. Yes. Definitely, I think, um, okay, so I come from Singapore, so the context in which I was taught English was that because, you know, we had three major races, Chinese, Malays, and Indians, and it was decided that English was the most neutral language, and that was why perhaps in this particular context, it might not be as contentious as perhaps English is, you know, in your context. So if the process of which, you know, Sorry, can I just finish this point, please? So perhaps if you find that English not being, uh, English being your first language instead of your native language, you know, that process was problematic for you, I um, send you my deepest sympathies. Anyway, okay, so now I have given you my silver linings. Moving on, the, some of the um, things which are harder to square, the thing about empire, the thing about it is that in this day and age, the very idea of empire implies there has to be a colonial master and there has to be a colonial subject, okay? And that is the fundamental premise of empire. And in this day and age, it is very difficult to be able to say to someone on the basis of race and culture that I am therefore superior to the other person. That is very problematic in itself. And I do not have to remind the house, you know, darker parts of our history where that really has caused a lot of carnage. Which also brings me to my final point. I'm giving you a mixed bag, I understand, which is why I'm abstaining currently, but, you know. My final point. In 1942, when the Imperial Japanese Army came, what happened to the Brits? Well, as you all know, they pulled out within a couple of weeks of Singapore, and we were essentially left to have to deal with the carnage, you know, Imperial Japan route upon British Malaya during that time. And it was a very dark, it was a very difficult part of our history. But nonetheless, all things considered, I would say that I'm, I would urge the House to be open-minded and to take in all that the speakers have to offer. And when you walk through those doors later, make an informed decision. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I'm going to move back to the paper speakers because we're making good progress. So, I will introduce you to Dr. Marie Deruda. Dr. Deruda is a lecturer and tutor at... Can we quiet down, please? 
uh, in French language and literature at Oriel College, the other place. She is a regular contributor to Unheard, The Telegraph and The Critic, where she writes about British and French heritage, the classics and post-colonialism. Dr. Dude, the floor is yours. Good evening. Can you hear me well? Yes. Well, it is a truth universally acknowledged that even in galaxies far, far away, all empires are bad. I, standing before you, would apparently be the embodiment of the nightmare mentioned by Nicholas earlier. I am a product of the French colonial empire in North Africa. So I know a couple of things about empires, having grown on the ashes of, let's say, a dozen fallen empires. There were the Phoenicians around, the Romans, a handful of Berber, Arab dynasties, then the French Empire. Well, in its heyday, the empire I come from went as far up north as Toulouse in the 12th century, and as far down as Timbuktu in the 18th century. Oh, the 18th century. We were big back then. The Moroccan Empire was, in fact, the first to recognize the independence of the United States of America. The reason for that was that it was getting more lucrative to trade with the US than with the British Empire, given that the British Empire was growingly reluctant to buy sub-Saharan slaves from North Africans. As a result, the empire I come from fell into bankruptcy and had to become a protectorate of the French colonial empire. I could ask for reparations, but I will show what we call in French, fair play. Because, well, we gave a hard time to your empire as well. We even made it as the bad guys in your first novel, Robinson Crusoe. So his first ordeal is to be captured and enslaved by the Moors. They didn't even give him drugs before. So, and that's not an isolated case. If you remember that beautiful poem by Thomas Davies, The Sack of Baltimore, it describes how in 1631, North African sailors burnt the village, killed the men, took the women as slaves, still not giving them any drugs. In 1641, 10 years later, among the grievances presented against King Charles I, one of the main points was that they, he didn't organize enough protection for southern towns in England against North African sailors. So, speaking of reparations, how much do I owe you? If you imagine that the territories conquered by the Western Empire were populated with peaceful savages who lived in complete innocence, you might want to review your biases. This idea is historically wrong. It negates the history of these countries before colonization and it is steeped in the very prejudices that have nurtured colonialism. I might also say that it is based on a very Western understanding of history. In the empire I come from, it was forbidden for more than a thousand years to draw or carve or sculpt anything figurative. How convenient. Many centuries of slave trading, a growing flow of sub-Saharan immigrants living in less than ideal condi conditions, but no statues to topple. How many Black Lives Matter protests in Morocco? None. That greed played a part in the history of the British Empire is true, but Western civilization does not have the exclusivity on greed. The civilizations that have made it into history books have done so because all our ancestors had one thing in common. They have killed 
raped, and looted. We, yes? Is it about my gloves? Otherwise, I'm not taking it. <laughs> I don't care about your gloves. I'm more concerned with the argument, actually. Bring it on. Just because any population aren't saints or aren't, you know, moral ideals uh, to be like, looked upon and to emulate, that means that it's right to mistreat anyone just because others are doing it. Like, the whole idea with empire is that it's wrong to, like, impose such domination and oppression among anyone, no matter who's doing it. Now, in this house, we're debating about the British Empire because, obviously, we are in Britain. Just like in another country, they're living with their own experience. I'm getting there, so thank you. So um, So, we see universities here in Britain turning away from the canonical elements of the British culture because they would be linked to imperial violence. Why is my curriculum so white, they ask. Well, I have not yet heard of any student in China or Asia complaining that their curriculum is too Asian. You're the only ones who whine about these things, really. While we decided that works of art linked to imperialism are too triggering for 20-year-old adult students, children in Africa and Asia are excited to learn about Homer and Shakespeare. The amount of self-scourging that Britain is inflicting upon itself is quite puzzling from a foreigner's perspective. And go tell an African student dreaming of Oxbridge or a refugee risking his life in Calais about systemic racism and microaggressions. Believe me, people who were not born here have gone through far worse than feeling microaggressed because someone has commented on their hairstyle. <laughs> the very principle, the very principles in the name of which we criticize the British Empire nowadays, Objection. equality, Objection. diversity, inclusion, were born and raised in the West. We should be grateful that the Western civilization and that the British Empire in particular has achieved more than killing, raping, and looting. At this very moment, multinational companies are doing more harm in Africa than the empires. They control the water, they own the mines. When some Western countries were empires, they shaped human rights, and now they sell weapons. I'm looking at you, France. At least in the imperial times, you'd send teachers and nurses to Africa, not when guns. The, the former protectorates and colonies that are now thriving have not destroyed the colonial legacy. Hospitals, schools, roads built by the empires were the starting point of these countries' development. Many empires have fallen into oblivion. What do you owe to my empire? But empires that have shaped national education Healthcare, political consciences, still are models of governance for former colonies. Values fluctuate and differ from one land to the other, but there are some absolutes that we should not take for granted, and that about which here, under this roof, we can agree. That individuals have a right to shape the state they inhabit. That everyone should have the same right to education, information, and freedom of thought and that the weakest should unconditionally be protected regardless of sex, religion, or ethnicity. These points were developed through the West's development of the Greek and Judeo-Christian heritage, which states that in the way the West has understood it, human life has an incommensurable dignity. This idea is still quite exotic in places that have not been influenced by Western thought, and in the places that have rejected Western influence, human rights are seen as dangerous and decadent. In case you've forgotten about it, in a non-Western expansionist empire just a few years ago was bombing traces of Middle Eastern history. You call the British Empire toxic, but I'd love to see you dealing with ISIS. I'd rather punt on the ISIS. Maybe you can afford to sacrifice the past to ideology but that's a luxury that I don't have. The idea that ethnic minorities are nothing but victims of the empire is currently breeding more prejudice and division than in imperial times. In my parents' times, textbooks in the French colonies had that phrase, nos ancêtres les Gaulois, our ancestors the Gauls. Maybe if I took a genetic test, I would know how much of my biological lineage is related to a Gaul slave girl. But 
Lineage is not a matter of biology. Belonging is not a matter of race. You do not need to tear out pages in history books to make minorities feel included. If you think that you can study and appreciate other countries' culture and past, but that we are unable to face yours without being triggered, well, that's racist. Ethnic minorities are perfectly capable of understanding that the British past is not perfect. We've been there. We know about the French, the German, the Dutch, and the Belgian Empire, and yours was better. We know the harm that the Empire has done. We also know firsthand the good it has done, and still does. Why do you think we come here to make this place our homeland? We have a shared past, a shared present, and a shared future. When Asians, Africans, Americans, and the rare few Brits who do not partake in the ambient self-loathing sing God Save the Queen or I Vow to Thee My Country on Remembrance Sunday, we do not deny our identity. We make Britain's past, present, and future part of who we are. The story of the British Empire is quite an astonishing one when you come to think of it. What's that tiny little island perched on the nose of Europe doing, meddling with the the other lands so far, far away. Well, I think you did rather well. We started from the same point. Look where you are. So every empire must fall. But I can think of one that started from a little corner on top of Europe, shaped modern democracy, fought totalitarianism, and gave humanity a certain idea of togetherness, refinement, and justice. Every empire must fall but one can be remembered with gratefulness. Ladies and gentlemen, long grip, Greater Britain. Thank you. Quiet down, there's one more speaker to go, and we're, we're almost there. Thank you very much, Dr. Duda. Just a reminder, um, it is your right to intervene at any time, and I do encourage you to do so. It is the right of the paper speaker to take them or not, but you can make them at any time. Um, concluding this, uh, proceedings this evening is Baroness Chakrabarti. Baroness Chakrabarti is a Labour politician, barrister, and human rights activist who has served as Shadow Attorney General for England and Wales and the Director of Liberty, a Civil Liberties Group. Banash Chakrabarti, finish us off. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Cambridge Union. It is wonderful to be back, and not virtually back, but actually back. Uh, and I came in solidarity with the student body. I have not been disappointed. The reason why I came, even though we're voting in Parliament today, etc., etc., is because I think your generation has had to deal with privations that no student body should have to deal with. And you've, you've done it so brilliantly, and you've come back fighting and disagreeing well in this union. Long may that continue. So, the motion before us is, this house regrets the fall of the British Empire. With, with the greatest respect to wonderful, wonderful speakers and interveners, it's not that this House regrets the manner of the falling of the British Empire, though that was pretty smart, if I may say so, <laughs> Mr McCarthy. It's not that this House hates Britain, or that this House loves ISIS, or that this... <laughs> or that... Right? Or, or that... Or that this... House doesn't understand nuance and complexity in history. Um, it, it, was, it was none of those things. It's this House regrets the fall, the fall, the end of the British Empire. And, and I would suggest to this House that whatever you think about roads, from <laughs> any remotely reasonable perspective, this motion must fall. Because either, it seems to me, empire is by definition an anti-democratic phenomenon whose demise cannot be a source of regret to enlightened people nearly a quarter of the way into the 21st century. Yes, please. 
Uh, I'm so sorry, sir, I can't hear you. Uh, yes, so, uh, one would say, and you would obviously say that uh, anyone is better off without an empire, and this motion has to obviously fall. But uh, would you say that to the people of Hong Kong, who are freedom loving people, and now. Okay. I hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me come to that. So either, you know, you, you take the argument that em empire, as opposed to democracy, empire. We're not debating democracy. We're debating the fall of the British Empire. Just to stay on, just to, just to stay on point, please, sir. I'll, I'll get to it. I promise. Give us a chance. Right. Empire is by de definition anti-democratic. Right. And we can't find the fall of any empire a source of regret per se, quarter of the 21st century. Or, or the British Empire is perhaps to some extent to be admired for not exactly falling, for example, via total bloody revolution, but ultimately transitioning, shall we say? If that wouldn't be too triggering for some people, transitioning. Um, some violence, considerable violence notwithstanding, over time into a commonwealth of relative democracies, or, for better or worse, depending on your point of view, some version of the British Empire still exists. That was Olivia from Homerton, by the way. That was a good point, too. Yes, please. Um, really and I will take a woman in a minute. Go on. No, 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 please. Yeah. I am in awe of all the letters uh, before and after May, and, and congratulations on those honours. What is your opinion, given that some people have rejected the honour on the basis? Yeah, yeah okay, I'll get to that. Yeah, I hear. I get, yeah, no, I'm, I'll get to that. No, I, thank you, thank you. That could have been more punchily put, but I get it nonetheless. <laughs> or so those three, or some mixture of the above. Now, the first argument for me is relatively. E easy, and it's been put so eloquently by others. Empire, by definition, brings domination, slavery, cultural appropriation, grand larceny on a breathtaking scale, and a legacy of structural inequality that sustains even today. And a world of competing empires, as we saw in the First Great War, is a world always at war. I can summarise that argument with one word, shame. And... Professor Hall made the case, and so others made it so, so well. The second argument is perhaps best supported by some of the post-World War II colonial ending, some of them, not all of them, clearly, and with many new constitutions that came post-World War II, built upon the rule of law, and after considerable growing pains, a contemporary commonwealth of 54 democracies and 2.5 billion people, a family of nations, fractious family at times, built upon common language and values rather than subjugation. So that's the second argument for not regretting the fall. We won't call that shame, we'll call that one pride. Or, as I say, you take this view that it hasn't really fallen, we're still in transition, where are we going to go with this? And if you look at Dr. Mazzani and listen to, to you know, to, to others who are thinking about the, you know, the better times and some good things that came out of the bud. You know, wherever there's an oak panelled room, the sun never sets and there's a tribute act to be done. And, and to answer the point about my titles and so on, I was made a commander of the British Empire 14, only 14 years ago, so perhaps it still exists. We'll call that argument nostalgia. Yes. Do you not think that we should detach ourselves from these moral judgments of empire? Like, the British Empire was, was a good empire, or the British Empire was a bad empire. Do you not think that this kind of promotes your essentialism in history as a discipline? Because it fails to recognise the long sweep of history within the, the, the past, over the past few hundred years. And do you not think that our, actually this motion creates a dichotomy? where we kind of view empire in a morally in a moral way. And do you not think that rather we should try and see empire for what it is, what it was kind of as a system that did good things and bad things and kind of try and view the neutral rather than this moral way. That's a very thank you for that. That's a really, really interesting intervention that goes, I think, to the heart of what some people perhaps 
overtly or, or, or not so overtly in the abstention category have, have reflected tonight. And what I would say is one does have to make a moral judgment about an imperial system because empires are, by definition, always wrong. Just because, they, just because we had them and just because there were many nations that had them over many, many hundreds and thousands of years doesn't mean that an imperium is the right way of governing ourselves, okay? So we can take that position without getting into a beauty contest for which empire was the best or the worst. And I think, that, I, I think that's an important point. And I would say that some of the better things... And, and by the way, like Dr. Dowd, you know, I don't want to be self-loathing about being a product of the British Empire. And you know what? I'm not. I can't really be, can I, with the pearls and the CBEs and the peerages and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's a, that's a longer conversation. But my point is, I don't need to be self-loathing about my heritage to be critical of our collective past. And that's what I say about the peerage test. And I feel that there's a woman that wants to intervene. I can just feel it. Point of order, point of order. Somewhere, someone. Somewhere out there. <laughs> really? Come on. You know you want to. You know you want to. You interviewed on all of them. Why not on me? <laughs> What's wrong with me? I don't agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> you might be. I, you might be. I'm not going to question. No, no, you. I'm not in charge. That's for sure. <laughs> no, absolutely. No. You're totally right. Look, you're totally right. I am not commanding the British Empire. <laughs> so, forensic examination and calm reflection around Britain's history and of empires over there and inequality over here and the slow but inevitable march towards emancipation everywhere seems more helpful to me to facing the present and future than undiluted shame, pride or even nostalgia for the past. And ultimately, and I can only pay tribute to Nick Davis and his stunning debut. Ultimately, what would it say about us in the spring of 2022 with war once more in Europe because of the czarist imperial ambitions of a narcissist kleptocrat out of control if we spent one nanosecond regretting the fall of the British Empire, rather than seeking to rebuild a new, genuinely internationalist moment based on equality between peoples and nations and a rules-based order that Britons and other Democrats once tried so hard to build after World War II. Please vote against the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Baroness Chakrabarti. If we could just remain in seats just for a couple of moments, I've got a few things to say and then we'll get into the bar. Um, first of all, um, I just want to say thank you to everyone this evening. Um, I think that was a very good advert for our society uh, and why what we do is important. Um, we always thank our guest speakers and I'd like to do so now, but I'd also like to congratulate the two student speakers this evening. I thought you were marvellous. <laughs>
I'd also just like to thank the North Cambridge Academy once again for coming. I hope you enjoyed your time here. Um, 